center. Come on, anybody thankful for Easter today? Make some noise if you're grateful that on the third day, he got up. Yeah, this really is a big deal for us Christians. It really is a big day for us. I hope to explain that a little bit more as we go through the message today. But I, I want to I wanna say thank you to Richard, who just shared his story with us. What a beautiful example of God's goodness in all of our lives and the way that God has continued his story in us and through us. I want to also congratulate all of you who were baptized on Good Friday night. 79 people. If we were living in the Bible days, it would be about 80. About 80 uh, people got baptized. We rounded up a little bit. And, uh, I, you know, I just, as a pastor, I kind of think that way anyway. I figure they missed a person or two at least. Like, but I'm so glad you're here. And Friday was a really special day, a really special time of new beginnings and people um, who were making decisions and acting out their faith <clears throat> in obedience to God's word in being baptized. And so what a weekend it's already been. I want to just jump forward and tell you that next week I'm going to continue the series on True North. And, and th this is uh, my, my voice or my thoughts on hot topics that are going on in the world today. And I'm going to be talking next week on, I'm going to be talking about our, our identity crises. I'm going to talk to you about the truth about who you are. And I just invite everybody to come back next week and bring a friend with you. And uh, we're going to continue to talk about things that are really relevant. And, you know, you're hearing everyone else and you're hearing all the other voices. So... I want to make sure I, I lean into and talk about some of the things that are taking up space in people's lives today, information-wise. So everybody say next week. Next say it again. Say next week. Next, week. next week's going to be a great, great time. I also want to celebrate everybody who makes our church happen. And I, I pulled in the parking lot here in Tacoma today. And we have some of the best looking people in the parking lot greeting and welcoming and I don't know, I know there were a lot of different people out there, but you guys were you guys with the beards and you, you just stuck out to me. I'm like, we got some cool men at Champion Center. And all the people behind the scenes and the children's classes and all around all of our locations. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you in DuPont. God bless you in Yakima. God bless you in Bellevue. God bless you online. God bless you right here in Tacoma on this beautiful Easter weekend. I'm going to invite you before you're seated to just say with me, my heart's open and my mind's ready. Make me better, God, by your word. I receive it. I believe it. And I won't be the same again. In Jesus' name, shout a great big amen. You may be seated today. When Jesus came to the end of his 33-year assignment, which is what his life was, it was an assignment, he declared with a loud voice as he hung on a cross, he declared, it is finished. He did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. And I want to talk to you a few minutes today on the topic of finished but not done. Finished 
but not done. Look at your neighbor and say, not done. Look at your other neighbor and say, he's not done. You see, the writer Luke wrote like this. He said, uh, on, this is on regard to Sunday, Luke 24, early in the morning. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord. Why? Somebody say, not done. The story goes on. The story continues. And so does, interestingly enough, the writer whose name was Luke. I want to tell you a little bit about Luke, the guy who I just read his writing in Luke 24. A bit of background on him is that he was not one of the 12 disciples. He was not Jewish, but Greek. If you know a little bit about history, then you, you light up right there because Greek people, especially in the day of Jesus, were renowned for their educational systems and their, their ability to really lead the world at that point through their understanding of, of life and science and very poetic. And Luke happened to be a medical physician and he was, he was very uh, astute, very proper. But he was also incredibly curious. And he followed and he recorded the life and the ministry of Jesus. When Jesus ascended into heaven, Luke thought that he was finished writing. And then he realized that the story wasn't over. So he, he picks the pen back up. And he started to write again what is called the Acts of the Apostle. And here's how the book of Acts begins. He says, in my former book, Theopolis, that's who he wrote the book of Luke 2 or addressed the book of Luke 2. He said, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. And then he elaborates a little bit on it. He said, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them for a period, over a period of 40 days. Somebody say 40 days. 40 days. A lot of people think that he went from the cross to the tomb, ascended into heaven. The resurrection actually began a 40-day process where he was seen, touched, heard by many, many people speaking about the kingdom of God. So what he's saying in this beginning of the book of Acts is that I decided to not stop with the ascension because he was finished with that chapter, but he wasn't done. It became obvious to Luke that there was something more, that there was something new, there was something big, that there was something huge. He's got to grab the parchment. He's got to grab something to write with. He's got to get this down. He's got to I watch the photographers around the, the, the room today, and, you know, they, they didn't have that. They only had, like, pen, paper, record. And he realized something big is going to happen and he delivered to us the book of Acts which is the recording of the actions of the apostles so 
Let me, let me share it with you in this way. When I talk about it being big, I'm talking about big. See, when Jesus was crucified in 33 AD, there, there were only about 120 followers. Today, 2.8 billion people profess to be Christians. The Christian church is by far, by far, the largest organization of people on planet Earth. But larger than China, lar larger than China and Europe put together. Is your mind blown yet? If not, larger than China, Europe, and the U.S. put together. How did this happen? How, how did we go from 120 gathered together holding on to every word that Jesus had spoke and a small group of people and now we've become this growing movement that spread around the world and is expected to number 3.5 billion by 2050. Don't, don't listen when people say it's going down, it's going away. No, 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 no. It's growing. All, all research agrees on that. That in the amount of people that are coming to believe, it continues. Somebody shout, not done. How does this happen? One word. Resurrection. Resurrection. It's the single most important event in history. I mean, nothing even comes close. It split history into B.C. and A.D. Think about that. Every other event in history is dated by the resurrection of Christ, either before or after. Even your birthday is dated by the day, the month, the year, on how long it's been since the resurrection of, of Jesus. So, like, if you are of the mindset and I get a feeling and I'm around you and a little vibe that wants me to feel small because I'm one of them, I just want to let you know right now you will not succeed because I know too much. Like, I don't feel small about this. I feel grateful about this. I feel thankful about this. In fact, if anything, I feel sorry. A, a few Easter's ago, I was shopping. I, I try to look nice on, on Easter. And, and uh, so I was shopping for a jacket a few Easter's ago, maybe five years ago. And, and as I'm looking for a jacket, the salespeople started gathering around. I think they were bored and weren't, weren't very busy. And, and one of them said, well, let me ask you, what do you, what do you need a jacket for? They were trying to be helpful. And I said, for Easter Sunday, church. And one of them looked back at me and said, church? You, you go to church? <laughs> the Seattle Times just released a report. 64%, I believe it is, of the people that live in the Seattle land area, they don't go to church. But can I just tell you, I don't feel small around those people. I, I don't feel bad. I don't get intimidated, and neither should you. <laughs> Seattle might not be there yet, but it ain't over yet. I said it's not over yet. What I'm telling you is the resurrection was not the end. It was a finished work that we now benefit from that happened on the cross, but I, I meant to say the cross was not the end. 
the resurrection was the beginning. You see, before the resurrection, there was no one who had even been baptized. And there was no salvation by faith before the resurrection. Before the resurrection, no one was called a Christian. Think about that. In our world, we're really quick to throw out labels and names. Well, before the resurrection, the word Christian, like it first happened in the city of Antioch. In Acts chapter 11, they were first called Christians. The believers were at Antioch. Antioch was called the cradle of Christianity, the birthplace, the beginning. So until now, that, that point, think about it, the book of Acts, the term Christian was never used, which means it was undefined. The book of Acts is where Christianity began to be defined. And I want to tell you today and talk to you today and just share with you today how the Christian life not just originated, but what the Christian life is actually about. You see, the Christian life is different from any other life. Christian life is based on the life and the teachings of Jesus. And it really is the best life this side of heaven. Biased, but true. Christians think differently. We believe differently. We, we have different values. We make different decisions, which then creates di different outcomes. Christians come in all ages, sizes, shapes, ethnicities, skin colors, cultures, background, educated, uneducated. I, I was just enjoying thinking about this weekend all over the world, different Christians gathering in different places, all kinds of culture. Some of it a little more tradition, some of it a little more bouncy, some of it a little more cool, hip, like just everywhere, Christians gathering, all different kinds of people. But there were, and there still are today, three distinct traits of the Christian life. Three, three distinct traits that if you look at the book of Acts were present and began to emerge. And here's what those traits are. Those three traits are believing, belonging, and becoming. Believing, belonging, and becoming. As they began to be called Christians, there were three things that were characteristics that you could say this is who they are. They're believers, they're, they're belongers, and they're actually becoming. If you listen to them talk, they're they're on their way forward. Believing simply means believing in the life and the teachings of Jesus. We're putting on the screen behind you right now what's called the Apostles' Creed. And I'm going to invite you to read it out loud with me today. And it basically summarizes in a few words put down in writing, summary the believers summarized this way. It starts with, I believe in God the Father. So if you're ready at all locations, I'm just going to give you an opportunity on this Easter. Let's read it together. It says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Are there any believers? Come on, are there any believers still alive who are believing in 2024? There's also a song like it might help you kind of trim it down. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Look at you, you know it. God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that he will come again. I believe in the name of Jesus. There you go. (laughs) Jesus said this, he said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. When people say, well, I, I don't really believe in God. I believe in science. That's like saying that you have to believe either in Henry Ford or the engine that powered the automobile. There is no engine without Henry Ford. There is no science without God. There is no creation without a creator. Have faith. Come on, have faith in God. Since we're talking about automobiles, when you see an automobile, just ask yourself, is there any way that that automobile could be the result of an explosion at a metal company? (laughs) And the rubber factory next to it, this big explosion, and... We have the automobile. Come on. That's true. That's true. Now, I used to be nicer about this when I was a younger pastor and all that, but I really, I have little respect for people's opinion who believe irrational theories and deny the reality of God. Very little respect for that opinion. You just, you just go buy your designer tennis shoes, look at them, and ask yourself, like, could a rubber leather factory have exploded and now I'm wearing these Adidas? It doesn't happen, folks. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are the creation of an almighty Come on, can somebody celebrate him today? I'm a believer. Look at somebody around you. Tell them, I'm a believer. I'm a, I'm a believer. Put that tag on me. I will wear it all day long. I am a believer. <laughs> Believing. Believing belonging and becoming. Belonging to God and his church was another trait that really stood out. Acts chapter 2 reads like this. It says, they devoted themselves 
they devoted themselves to the believers, to the apostle teaching and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers, and day by day, attending church together and breaking bread, hanging out in their homes. They received their food with glad, generous heart, praising God. And then the result of that was favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. (laughs) Belonging. You see, the church is where I learned to be a man. Church is where I learned to love my family. Church is where I learned to honor God and put Him first. Church is where I learned how to treat women. Church is where I learned how to get along with people different than me. Church is where I learned leadership. Church is where I learned not to quit when I got frustrated and upset and angry. Not to run away. Church is where I learned that the sensitivities of my heart that would cause me to retreat into isolation, feel like somebody, you know, had done me wrong. Church is where I learned not, not to be led by my offense or by my feelings. I learned in church to be strong. I learned in church to not give up. I learned in church to be a warrior. See, you're not meant to do life alone in isolation. And neither am I. You're formed for family. You are created for community. Ephesians says it like this. You are members of God's very own family. Citizens of God's country. You belong. Somebody shout, belong. Belong. Believe and what? Belong. You belong in God's house with every other Christian. You don't belong at home on the couch on Sunday morning. You belong in God's house. You belong with God's people. A little, little confession is good for the soul. If you're a believer, if you're a believer, say this with me. Just say, I belong in God's house. house. Say, I belong with God's family. I belong with with other Christians. Christians. Believers belong. People sometimes argue, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And you know, they could be absolutely right. In one sense, like you become a Christian by faith alone in Christ alone, no doubt about it. In a similar way, it's also true that you don't have to go home to be married. No, I'm talking to all you men that send your wives to church on Sundays and you, you were nice enough to come with them today. You don't belong home. And somebody approaches you and you go, well, I, I'm a Christian. I'm, 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 a, man, I, I, I'm a man of faith. Uh, yeah, well, get yourself off the couch, out of the living room, because you belong here with God's people. You belong here. You belong here. Think about 
about what I'm telling you. Like, you, you don't have to go home to be married, but stay away long enough, and your marriage will be affected. Your children's future will be affected. The plan that God has for the family, your family, will be derailed by you being absent. Absentee fathers is one of the greatest issues, problems that we have in society today. We want to call it a lot of other things, but research shows that so many of the troubles in our youth and our children and our young adult comes from not having a father in the home. Being a better father, a better parent, starts by being home, by being present. I tell men, I tell men as often as I can, I've told a few women that when they're ready to like, like not have anything to do with it anymore, I'm like, you, you, you go get in your, your truck and, and go home. Well, I don't, go home. Go home. Well, it's uh, at home, it's uh, go home. You belong with your family, participating in your family life. And the same is true for a believer. Being a better Christian starts by being present, by being planted in God's house. I've looked at, I saw, I've only looked at it a little bit because I I don't want to feed on it, but I saw there's some sort of a social media space that is for uh, people to complain about church and what they don't like about church. And I I saw enough of the complaints. I thought, yeah, we we do all of those at Champion Center. Like, that happens. (laughs) That, that, That happens. Like, yeah, that happens too. Yeah, I know that happens. Yeah. Yeah, that that happens. Even the blatant ones, like, yeah, we talk about money here. Yeah, we do. Like, we we lift our hands here. Oh, dang it. I know you don't like that, but we ain't changing for you. Like, we we do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we do that. And one of them I read was like, when the pastor has you repeat things. I'm like, guilty, like, oh, have been doing that for many, many years. But here's the thing, like, we don't do church for all your little preferences. We're different. God brought us together. If you don't belong at Champion Center, great. Go find where you do belong because there's a church that you belong to in if you're a believer you belong in the house of God with all God's people (laughs) oh I'm just making some of y'all mad right now hey but think about it think think about this if you if you have a trainer a physical trainer in your life you don't want them to tell you like oh it's okay go lay down over there you'll get some muscles (laughs) So I'm your pastor. I'm a pastor. I've been doing this 30, almost 40 years. I'm not going to tell you, it's okay. Go lay down over there. I'm going to say, get yourself up, grab a weight, start turning some... Oh, it doesn't feel good. Yeah, that's what becoming a man of God is all about. Embrace it. Come on, embrace it. Oh my 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 Tell somebody God's not finished with me yet. Come on, you may be seated a couple more minutes. Because it's about believing, it's about belonging, and it's about becoming. And I want to tell you, God's sending some people into your life. I could be one of them. 
but God sending people into your life and it's it's uh, norm it's gonna look in many cases normal but it really is a setup because God's not finished with you yet it's a divine connection orchestrated by God because God's not done with you yet you see you are you are becoming when you when you walk in God's plan and you as a believer start belonging then you will begin to become who you were created to be and that's God's ultimate plan that's what being a Christian is all about is that that you know that that saying that is um, in fact that tell somebody if you're sitting by somebody that knows you right now just tell them just tell them really quickly say say to them say be patient God's not finished with me yet. <laughs> See, God loves you like you are, but he loves you enough not to leave you like you are. And not only that, he loves you, he loves the people that live with you enough to not leave you like you are. And Jesus said when he was getting ready to go away and ascend into heaven, he said, another one is coming, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go away, but the Holy Spirit is coming, and I've been with you, but he will be in you, and he's going to be your helper, and he's going to teach you, and he's going to remind you of the things that I have spoken to you, and he's going to be with you everywhere, every, everywhere you go, every day. And what he was saying is, this is, God's not done with you. I, I did my part. I finished what I was here to do. But another one is coming and he will never leave you. He will be with you every morning in quiet and in loud. And then something started to happen that is still happening today. I met some people Friday night at Bellevue, several of those who were baptized, I, I got to meet them and there was a man who wrote a note to us. He was watching online. I remember one of the team members bringing me the note. This man was watching online from Greece and it was his first time to ever watch us or know about us and on Friday night, I was at the Bellevue location and he and his daughter were baptized on Friday night at the Bellevue location. Like you never know. I met, a, I met another man who came to an event for men 14 years ago that we had here at the Tacoma location. And funny part about that story is a friend told him, hey, come go with me. It's really going to be fun. It's going to be a great event. They got motorcycles jumping and all kinds of fun stuff going on. You're going to love it. The man didn't know till he got here that he was coming to a church. <laughs> but God did something in his life that night, and I, I just met him for the first time. So 14 years has gone by. I met him and his beautiful family on Friday night. God, God wasn't finished in his life 14 years ago, and God's not finished now, is what I'm telling you. God's not finished now. I met another young man, UW football player, who was baptized in Bellevue on, on Friday night and uh, had no church background, really. I got to hug his neck, talk to him for a few minutes, and I got a little carnal, honestly, in the moment. I, I thought it was funny. I didn't say anything to him, but I walked away, and I, I was like, yeah, um, you dub made it to the, you know, to the national playoff, uh, national championship game this past year, and they lost the national championship to a team, Michigan, uh, beat them at the, na no, no Michigan fan noise right now. Have respect. <laughs> Have respect. You're in Washington right now. Have respect. Somebody started a clap here. I'm shutting them down for all you UW fans. Like, I'm shutting them down. Don't. 
But what I thought was funny, just a little funny natural thing came in my mind. I thought, who knows? Like, because I heard a story that Coach Harborough told, told after they, they beat Washington. He said over 70 of the players were baptized this past season. 70 of the Michigan players were baptized. He said, like, we had a real, you know, revival in our team. And, and I thought, oh, that's it. That, that's the missing ingredient. So we got one baptized. Who knows? Like, we could win a national championship. We just need a few more believers. Okay, that was a fun, little fun thing. But here, here's what I'm trying to tell you as I close today. 79 stories win a Friday night. 79, not, not three people got baptized. 79 people got baptized. 79 Come on, 79 stories of people who are believing, belonging, and becoming. And to all of you, I want to tell you there's an unfinished work of God that he wants to do in your life. And I don't know your name. I don't know where you came from. I don't know your background. I don't have to. But there's an unfinished work that God wants to do in your life. You wouldn't be here if God was done with you. You wouldn't be breathing today. You wouldn't have got up this morning if God was done with you. Yeah, it's going to require you to have an openness to change because the process of becoming who you're meant to be will, will require you to respond to God's spirit working in your, in your heart, calling you to make some decisions, form some new habits in your life. Like, and you're not going to be able, I can't promise you to stay comfortable and, and become who God created you to be. But I would say that if you're here today and you're open to God, I would just tell you God is so ready for an invitation to come into your life. If you're here today and you're, you're a believer who's stuck, let today be the day that you get unstuck from where you are. The day where you began to walk the path again that God has for your life. I don't know how to explain the offense you had at that other church. I don't know how to explain the season you've had away from God's people. I can't tell you all that. I can just ask you today, would you align yourself in a space, in a position where God can continue his work in your life? Because there's an unfinished work that God wants to do. He's not done. He's not done. So with every head bowed and every eye closed today, I want to ask you the most important question. If your life were to end today, are you at peace with God? Do you know where you'd spend eternity? And if not, I would love to pray with you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to criticize you. I'm here to help you find a new beginning. Find your way back, perhaps, to the path that God has for you, the relationship with him that he planned to have with you since the foundation of the world. If you're a believer, but you've grown cold towards God, you... You need a fresh new start today. Let today be that. Let this prayer be that. I've been praying for you all week long. And right now, I'm believing that this is a moment for a new beginning in your life. And if that's you, I'm just going to ask you, whoever you are, wherever you are, let's start with just raising a hand up in the air and raise it high. Good hands are going up right here. Hands are going up around the room right here. A new beginning, a new time. God's not done with me. You raise your hand. You say, I know God's not done with me yet. Pastor Kevin, I know today is a new start for me, a new beginning. Good, 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 good. A new walk of faith. Good, good, good. With hands raised high, everybody else is joining with you today. Say it out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, welcome to my world. Forgive me of all my sin. Come into my life and make me a new person. I receive you now. 
as my leader and my Lord, and I boldly declare I'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. And I want to be the first to welcome you today to a brand new beginning. God bless you.